Well, good to, well, I'd say good to see you, even though I can't see you. I'm just like seeing you all in faith, and I just, um, I'm again so glad and thankful for technology, because I think it was about six years ago or so, seven years ago, uh, we had first gotten here, we did not have live streaming and a lot of the technology, um, it, well, it wasn't easily as readily available. We weren't ready yet. We had a snowstorm, and I think, um, I think we had a little bit of church at home featuring me in front of the fireplace, Erica holding the phone in front of me, um, hoping that our Wi-Fi signal was strong enough with a quick live, uh, live stream. That was Worship at Home, and today you get a way better experience. Thank you to the band. Thank you guys. They came in, braved the snow, and um, for the most part, most of us get to stay warm, worshiping in our pajamas. So good to see you today. Now, you're at home, uh, but if you think about it, we've got a little extra benefit, right? I mean, you save some drive time. Um, you'll maybe start to get a little bit of cabin fever by the end of the weekend, which just gives you more time to pray. And it works out well because we're in this series of 21 days starting the year on our knees in prayer. And so I want to make sure, um, don't, don't just like engage the service and then watch Ridge Kids afterwards, um, you can find that on our, our YouTube channel as well, and then go about your day doing whatever, but make sure that you spend some time today uh, in prayer. Today we're in day, it's day 14 of, uh, of Pray First, and if you're following along in your book, you didn't get a book, that's okay, go to our church website, it's right there, you can download a book, and we're putting every day's uh, prayer prompts on our Facebook page as well. But today, interestingly enough, today um, the prayer prompt is to think about how God is raising up leaders in generations. And so today's prayer prompt is, who do you see who's younger than you, who shows so much potential? Write their name down and pray for them to hear God's call on their life. Who do you see who's older than you and has so much to offer, but maybe they don't see it? Write their name below and pray for them to hear God's call on their life. Um, Make, some, make sure, write down a couple of names. God's going to give you their names. And I just believe as God gives you their names, write it down, pray for them, intercede on their behalf. Help them to see themselves as God sees them. And tell you what, here's a, a, a special way we're going to pray today. Uh, yesterday afternoon, boy, talk about prayer. Uh, we prayed and prayed, watched the weather, because we had uh, 78 students and about 20 or so, a few more adults, signed up and ready to go for this holiday week, this four-day weekend, um, and they were ready to go to winter retreat, and all week long the weather was looking like they may not be able to go. We prayed, we prayed hard, the weather held off, they loaded up two coach buses and then a couple of church vans, and we sent them off yesterday evening to Lebanon. Oregon, and they are hanging out. They're having a great time. If you check uh, the Ridge Facebook page, you can see some updates, but God is working and moving in a powerful way in our students' lives, and uh, there's just something special when you give a whole weekend to pursuing God together, hanging out with your church friends. So can we do this? Before we dive into our teaching today, can we just take a minute, and I want you to imagine a room full of 78 middle school and high school students and 20 plus adults who are there loving on them, discipling them. And now I just want you to, instead of just imagining a room full of 100 people, zoom in, and if you know any of our middle school, high school students as a part of our church, maybe you just imagine them and you can zoom in on them or their friend. And I want all of us to pray right now. I don't know what time they're gathering to worship this morning, but sometime they're going to gather, have one of their several worship service and teaching times will happen this morning. Let's do this. Let's pray. All of us together, we're going to pray that God's voice would be the loudest voice that they hear um, and that God moves our students to, bold, to take bold, courageous action, steps of obedience. Can we do that, church? Come on, here we go. Let's, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. And with every one of us, even if you're watching this later in the day, right? Like they're going to continue to worship and even have a time of worship tomorrow. Come on, let's pray. And God, I just pray for our students. And I pray for the student that I am imagining right now, that you would speak so loudly to his life. Speak words of truth over him, into him, and may he hear how you hear the words that you have to, to, to say to him. And God, that he would begin to see himself as you see him. Not as all the other messages would 
that they, they come to him. And Lord, that your voice would win the day and he would take bold steps to trust you, to love you. Oh God, we pray for our students bring transformation in their lives, a, a boldness to follow you, to honor you, to obey you, a, a, a deep desire to open their Bibles and to read your words of truth, to hear from you, to pray and to seek your face. And God, that you would raise up strong leaders in the next generations. And that we, Lord, would be good examples godly examples and that we would model your way of living that it would be attractive and that we would show that it is your way is the best way god we pray today do your great work bring these students and adults back safe to us tomorrow afternoon we pray in your name amen okay we prayed now now let's connect it to exactly what we're going to talk about today so did something happen when I believe like hundreds of us in the last two minutes prayed and we prayed over a group of students gathered in one place. Did something just happen? Yes. A couple of years ago in our conversations and a teaching about prayer, I said something that really struck a nerve with a few people because they actually remembered it a couple weeks later and repeated it, um, which, you know, probably doesn't happen as often as I would like it to happen. But regardless, and they said, here, here, here was the, the statement that when we pray, something changes in the universe. Like that our prayers make a real difference. What is that? So, so we're going to ask some of those questions today. You know, I think about when I was growing up, we'd go visit my grandparents in northern Wisconsin. And if you want to see what cold weather is, go to Wisconsin. This like 20 degree weather is like normal. Um, so it's okay. We're, we're not used to it around here. Anyways, we would go to my grandparents. And um, when we go to my grandparents, usually on Sundays, we would go to the little country church where my mom grew up going to church and she met Jesus and the little country church, it had been somewhat updated, it had painted, it was warm, it had heat, but it didn't have running water, like truly still had, even way, you know, back in the 80s, had the outhouse out back. And um, in that little country church called the Green Grove Church, and the front of the, front of the church, kind of behind where the preacher stood, there was this large traditional painting of Jesus knocking at the door, you may, may have seen this before. And then on the right and the left, there were two little signs. Now, I don't remember the one on the left, Left, but I'm pretty sure the one on the right, it said, prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. As an encouragement to us to continue to pray, to keep praying, pray because prayer changes things. How does prayer change things? Sometimes we say, well, we don't really know, but William Temple, a preacher and a leader in the, uh, in the 1940s, he said this, that, that when, when folks would say, well, prayer is just coincidence. And he said, okay, well, maybe it is, but I've discovered when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't pray, coincidences don't happen. And so maybe prayer is just coincidence that I prayed and, and it happened, but the more I pray, the more things happen. So continue to pray and the observations are start praying more and you're going to notice more answers to prayer. But how does it all work? Can we somehow explain it? So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm going to take some time and I'm going to try to answer three questions. We're going to dive in deep. I'm going to invite you to put your thinking caps on and we're going to try to answer these three questions today. Number one, can we explain prayer using reason and logic? And I would say yes, we can and I'm going to uh, attempt it. Uh, number two, why aren't our prayers answered? And number three, what do I do when my prayer isn't answered? So we're going to think, but we're also going to get personal. We're going to get spiritual today. And so let's dive in with the first question here. Can we explain prayer using reason and logic? In other words, in our modern scientific world, does it make sense to believe in prayer and to practice prayer. How can we explain it? Well, let me, let me just start by, by explaining it this way, okay? Um, I've got a couple of, of marbles here. And so if I take a marble and I let go of it, you know what's going to happen. It will fall straight to the floor. Why? Gravity. And we know that gravity just simply, you know, what we describe usually as gravity is that things go up, must come down. The reason they go down is because the mass of earth is so big, so great, there is so much mass that the mass of the earth attracts to it the tiny little mass in the marble. And so when I let go of the marble, 
the Marble Falls. If we were on the moon, which has about 16% of the gravity as Earth because it's smaller, it's less dense, therefore it has less gravity, the marble might fall, but it'll fall significantly slower. Something really in else interesting happens, though, with gravity. If I take another object, and yes, I know, this is a playground ball that is filled with air, but I just want you to imagine that it is more like the density of a bowling ball and that it's heavy. And if I take the marble and I drop the marble, the marble still falls to the floor. But here's what happens. If you were to watch it closely, if you were to slow it down, and if you were to measure it with scientific instruments, what you would discover is that as the marble falls to earth, the closer it gets to the balloon, it actually veers off course a little bit. And instead of falling straight to the ground like it did with no massive object next to it, with another massive object, as it falls to the ground, the mass of this secondary object attracts the marble a little bit, just a tiny little bit, so that the marble lands in a different place than it would have if this had not been here. It's gravity. Here's, 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 here's where I'm going with this. The laws of nature are these invisible effects that we see that kind of cause our world to operate. And, and, and God, we just believe that God set up the earth, the moon, all the other planets, and that the universe is, is just in perfect balance. Everything is the perfect distance so that the force of gravity keeps everything just where it's supposed to be. It's, it's, it's amazing how God set it up. But, but, but listen, we believe in the laws of nature, that they are these invisible powers that affect the world. And, and because we believe in the invisible laws of nature, this invisible power, when I drop the marble, the presence of another mass changes the course that the marble fell. And we don't know how exactly how to explain it, but we know that it happens every time. The laws of nature, invisible power that affects the world. How about the, the power of emotion? Maybe we can summarize it this way. A long time ago, the story goes, and it may be a... It may be a <clears throat> it, it, May, may not have actually happened, but the story goes that Ernest Hemingway, the famous author, someone, well, someone bet him that he couldn't write an entire story in six words. He thought about it. He said, I'll take that bet. And he told a story in six words. Here it is. For sale. Baby shoes. Never worn. Oof. Did, did, you, did you feel it? This heaviness, the sadness, induced by a simple story? I told you a story in six words and influenced your emotions, influenced how you felt. And you and I, we're separated by who knows how much distance and digital communication, but, but your emotions, I affected your emotions. It's the power of emotion and emotional communication. It's invisible power that affects how people feel. Or just think about the power of, of words. Over the Christmas season, we, we talked for four weeks about the power that our words have and that even the Bible affirms that, that our words can bring life or death and how we use our words doesn't just kind of influence people it affects people if you're walking down the street and I say stop even if you don't really want to stop even if you don't really like me we're just strangers if I say it like that you're probably at least for a moment going to stop look at me wonder why I'm telling you to stop and if a car zooms in past you and you stopped you're gonna be thankful like my word one word can change how you behave. If I come up to you and I say, hey, that shirt looks great on you, chances are you're going to wear it more often. 
If I come up to you and say, you know, that shirt does not look so great on you. One word might change the frequency with which you wear that shirt. Or that one word just might change your emotion towards me and be like, I like this shirt, but I don't like you anymore because of one word. The power of words. Think about it. Just like emotion. Just like the laws of nature. An invisible power that changes how people see themselves. And so if you think about it, like all around us, we have all different, we have different kinds of invisible power and invisible powers that produce real change. I just give you three examples of them. So think about this, think about this. We already believe in the invisible power of the laws of nature, the invisible power of emotions, and the invisible power of spoken words, any of which can change how people think, act, feel. We already have a logical, reasonable, reasonable basis for thinking about invisible power that we can't quite explain how it operates, but we know that it's real. We already believe in invisible power that produces real change. And so it isn't that much of a stretch of our imagination to believe in the invisible power of God to produce real change. Part of what I want you to hear this morning is that it's not so much prayer that changes things, but it is God Almighty who at his core is invisible, who has power to change us, the world, the weather, that God himself has invisible power to produce real change. And so Jesus, he touches the eyes of a blind man. And when he says be healed, his eyes are healed. God and the invisible power of God restores his sight. He goes over to a man who's lying down on a mat, placed there by his friends, and he cannot walk because he's disabled. And Jesus takes him by the hand, lifts him up, and the invisible power of God instantly strengthens his legs. The power of God. And then Jesus looks at his followers. And if you're a follower of Jesus, and, and I'm a follower of Jesus, this, this applies to us as well. Jesus looks to his followers and teaches his followers, and he says, hey, the same power that you see resulting, the same power, that, that, the, the, the power of God that produces real change, you have access to that power. That you and I can tap into God's power for real change. Listen to, listen to what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 7, starting verse 7. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? You wouldn't do that. Or if your son asks you for a fish, which of you will give him a snake? If you then, even though you're evil, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And so Jesus says, you're going to see some amazing things. You too can experience that. You too can watch the power of God at work. Just ask. Just ask God for what you want. We call that prayer. Asking God to use his power to make real change in somebody's life, in world affairs, in political affairs, in the weather. And God says, I can do that. Just ask. Look at, uh, look, look at uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 22 to 24. We read this. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if someone says to this mountain, and he points to a mountain, go, throw yourself in the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I ask you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, 
and it will be yours. And so Jesus says, this is this prayer, right? Prayer is asking God for what you want, tapping into God's power, and you ask and believe, okay? So ask and believe, have faith. But faith is not just like having faith in general. Faith is believing that God can do what you're asking him to do. Faith is believing that God will do what you ask him to do. And so ask him, ask him in faith, trusting, and it'll happen. And Jesus says, if you ask that God move that mountain and you believe that he will, that mountain will jump up and be thrown into the sea. Now, it would be fair to ask, why have we no observed accounts of mountains being thrown into the sea? Because nobody ever really believed that God had a need or desire or want or that it was necessary for humanity to help out anything at all for a mountain to be relocated into the sea. We believe that it can. We just don't have faith that God would want to. What would be the purpose of that? Would it really be helpful? And so, we've never observed it. But he says God can. And so part of the issue of faith is not just, I believe that anything is possible, but it is also, like, it's not just that prayers, it's, it's just about prayer, it's that, what does God really want to happen? Is this in line with God's character? Do I really want or need this to happen? And as you do, and you tap into God's character and tap into God's power, it will be done. Ask, and it will be given to you. Ask, it will be done for you. Believe, and it will happen. And it sounds good. It's logical. It's reasonable. Just as reasonable as the other invisible powers of the universe that we already make use of every single day. Until it happens. You know what the it is? The it happened in my own life when last April, sitting in a large church service with a whole bunch of pastors, Nazarene pastors on Western Washington, our district leader, we call him a district superintendent, he's basically like my pastor and he leads us. We sat in a room and he presented vision, the vision that God had given him and plans to reach people in Western Washington through churches of the Nazarene just like ours, about 80 or so. He had this vision and we had plans for some really exciting, great things happening in the city of Seattle that God was going to do. And we were praying and we were planning and we were dreaming and he was leading us and he had a vision. That was April. He was making plans for how God would work through our church. And by September, we were making plans for his funeral. Because little did he know it, but that even while he was making plans and giving vision, as he felt God led him to do, there was a tumor growing in his body. Shortly thereafter, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Okay, now think about this. Think about this. What, what do you do when somebody who is far too young, well, it doesn't matter how old they are, it, it, what, what do you do when, when your friend, when your leader is diagnosed with stage four cancer. You, you say, God, I pray that you would heal. God, I pray just like you put your hands on the blind person and he was able to see, just like you took the hands of the disabled man and you picked him up and his legs were instantly healed. God, I pray that my friend would be healed from cancer. I pray that my pastor would be healed from cancer. And God, you said that mountains can be uprooted. This seems like not as hard as a mountain, right? So God, I believe you can. I believe you want to. He's a pastor. He's leading. Did we have enough faith? I mean, we prayed and prayed and prayed. I went to special prayer gatherings with other people where we prayed over him to bring healing. The healing that didn't come. I mean, I mean, think about this. Jesus said, just ask and have faith. Here's a pastor being prayed for by a bunch of pastors. There should have been a lot of faith in the room. If there wasn't, we're all messed up. In a short time, he passes away, loses his battle to cancer. Our prayers weren't answered. At least the prayers for healing in short order. So why aren't our prayers answered? I'm going to get in a moment to why isn't my prayer answered. Right now we're going to start with why aren't our prayers answered. So I, so I have to ask you to do a favor, okay? 
whatever is the big prayer that you've been praying for, I'm going to ask you for a moment to kind of put that on the shelf. We're, we're going to come back to it. But, but what I want to do, you see, because, because all of our prayers, we're very emotionally tied to them. And the only way to answer this question, why aren't our prayers answered, is we need to have kind of a little more of a, a reason and logic-based conversation. And the only way to do that is to kind of separate ourselves from an emotional situation so that we can think logically, okay? So just, just go with me if you would. Let's think of all of humanity. How do we explain why our prayers aren't answered? Um, and, uh, and, and to do that, I'm going, to, I'm going to go to my trusty whiteboard here. And I want to... Uh, I want to show you a little bit of an example. The, the best way that I have been able to come up with of, to, to explain why aren't our prayers answered. Um, come on. Okay. Um, to do this, I'm going to use the example of the, uh, the red line. The, the, the idea of the, the red line kind of has been used in the last 50 or so years, especially in kind of international diplomacy, in which countries where there's kind of a war, invasion, potential war, will talk about drawing a red line. And so a country will say, look, look, look to, to another country or another leader. Like, we recognize you, and we don't want to have a war. We don't want to invade you. We don't want to drop bombs. And so, this is where the line is. And as soon as you cross the red line, there will be consequences. As soon as you cross the red line, whatever the red line might be, it might be a geographical location. As soon as your armies advance past that point, we'll drop some bombs. As soon as you take this action, if you go nuclear, whatever it might be, right? So, this idea of we're going to draw a red line and it's a firm line and as soon as you cross it, there will be consequences. When I think about prayer, I thought about maybe, maybe God. Well, if, when I think about it, if God is good, like surely God would have a, a red line, okay? And, and that red line would be any, anything that crosses the line that he would automatically heal it. And so when you think about it, like where, where should God, if God is good and loving and holy, where should God draw the red line? Well, I mean, here, here, here'd be my, my, my best guess, okay? Let's put the red line at childhood cancer. Like, surely we can agree that if God is powerful, that no child should die of cancer. And so I'm going to put that kind of like above the line, and if God is good and all-powerful and can heal, then any child who's diagnosed with cancer should be healed automatically. Because if God can heal, how, how can he let kids die of cancer? But then we have to answer the question like, okay, okay we've, we've identified childhood cancer, so how do you define childhood? Well, like, well, well, it's easy, right? So, uh, younger than 18 years old. So that means as soon as you turn 18, you're eligible. God doesn't have to heal you. I mean, I mean, why 18? Because modern culture has decided that 18 is the age of adulthood. What about 30 years old, which was the age of adulthood in Bible times? Well, if it's under 30... Now we have to redraw the line. And all of a sudden, all the 31-year-olds, like, I, you're, you're fair game for, tar you're for cancer, right? Okay, okay, we'll go for that and say, okay, well, um, well, what about, I mean, we talked about childhood cancer, okay? So, so maybe we can just kind of go, go back to, maybe we can go back to, to this, okay? Childhood cancer, 18 years old, we've got to draw the line somewhere, okay? So let's just choose 18. Um, so nobody under the age of 18 is allowed to die of childhood cancer, instant healing, okay? But what about automobile accidents? Like 14-year-olds, 2-year-olds can die in an automobile accident. God doesn't have to like intervene, stop it, heal those situations, but they can die of cancer. Shouldn't, shouldn't we also include accidents? And we redraw the line. And here's what happens, okay? Thinking about it logically. At this point, at this point, um, if God sets a policy, a red line, so that no child ever dies of cancer, that means there has never known, we have never known a case where any child has died of cancer. It just never happens. 
It's an impo- as far as we humans know, it's impossible because there's never, ever, ever been a case God has always healed it. What would happen is that you and I, in our sense for justice and compassion, we would continue to redraw the line until we insist that God heal everything, every time, for everyone. That no one ever dies, no one ever suffers. We would redraw the line. Part of the problem with that is then that no one could ever do anything that would ever hurt anyone else. The, the, the result of drawing the line is that the world is perfect and wonderful, but you and I have no freedom at all, and we love our freedom, don't we? And it seems like the world that God has set up, he has set up this world in which we are free to love him or reject him. And as God wants us to love and to be loved, to make that happen, he gives a certain amount of freedom. The more we move the line and we require God to intervene every single time, every time we move the line, a little bit more freedom is washed away. And eventually, I would argue, we'd be mad at God because we don't have any freedom. Now, now think about it this way, and then we're going to move on. What if? What if God's already drawn a red line and that there are diseases and actions and suffering more horrible than we can even imagine. And the reason we can't imagine is it's never, ever happened because God has already drawn a red line and he hasn't explained himself. And we couldn't even imagine the horrors of what he already keeps us from because he's already drawn the red line. And in the end, he says, I just need you to trust me. If, you, if you're not okay with this, and, and this shouldn't set perfectly well, because every explanation in which we try to give a reasonable explanation for, for God, it, it's like, it's good enough, but it's never perfect, because, because, because God just doesn't have to explain himself. If all of this still really makes you angry, here's the question I want to ask you. Do you want to be responsible for making the decision for where the red line is drawn? When I thought about that, I was like, oh, see, I just like to complain when God doesn't do what I want him to do and doesn't answer the prayers I ask him to, pray, to, to, to ask, ask, answer. But the reality is, I don't want to be responsible for drawing the red line. That's pressure and stress that I'm not willing to take on. And my guess is, neither do you. And so we look and we say, oh, wow, this, this is a pretty complex situation. Oh, oh, it's complex. It gets, it gets even more complex. Let, let, let's continue on. Um, the, the next thing I wanna, want you to think about today. Another little illustration since we're using the, uh, using the whiteboard today. Let's just continue thinking about just how complex things are. Okay, um, this is a, a little, little, little example here. And we're going to call this guy uh, Michael. Michael is 25 years old. He is a completely imaginary person. I'm not thinking in my mind of anybody named Michael, but I discovered that in 1998, which is about the year a 25-year-old would have been born, Michael was the number one name in the United States for males. And so we're just going to go for it, okay? So 25-year-old Michael is struggling in life. 25-year-old, he's a friend of mine. And um, well, his name, the name Michael actually means who is like God. And, and, and Michael's parents raised him to follow God and to go God's ways and to live like God. But Michael has gone his own way, done his own thing. And he's experiencing a lot of consequences and a lot of pain. And, and life is really, really hard. And some people have been really mean to him and, and done some really bad things. He's carrying some trauma and those things really hurt. He's also made some really bad decisions for himself. Um, and, well, he's, he's walking away from God's best for his life. 
And so I'm praying for my friend Michael. And I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying. And I'm like, God, change him. God, change him, his circumstances. God, help him. God, help him to see that you are the one true God, that you are the way to, to life, that you are the way, that you are the truth, that you are the life, that he would trust himself in you. And God, I'm just, it breaks my heart to see him making bad decisions. And he's struggling to like get a job and feel successful in life. So God, help him to be successful. I'm praying for my friend Michael. Well, as I'm praying for my friend Michael... I've got to realize that there is, there's a lot going on in Michael's life. Um, and if I could, maybe I could draw it like this. And that God has given Michael freedom. A kind of personal freedom. Because God wants Michael to love him in return. God wants Michael to obey him freely and choosing to free. So God has given some freedom. And unless Michael somehow decides to change his life, if I'm praying and I say, God, you're a God of power, change his life. God has to penetrate that freedom and break that freedom and overrule that freedom that God has already given Michael. Now, I believe that we humans have freedom, but we don't have philosophical free will. And the difference is that our freedom is given by God, and because God controls our freedom, God reserves the right to step in at any time and override our freedom. He's God. He has the right to do that, and sometimes he does that. I would suggest he doesn't do it very often, though. And so if I'm getting frustrated that like, why isn't God answering my prayer, changing Michael's life? Maybe part of it is because God says, for some reason, I've chosen not to override Michael's freedom. Okay, that makes sense to most of us. As I thought about it, though, I realized there is more going on and there are more barriers to Michael changing than just his personal freedom. How about, how about this barrier here? Let's, let's make another layer. And this barrier could be labeled the... Um, the so-called truth and the stories that he believes. And I say truth in quotation marks because, well, everybody believes and thinks, we think that what we believe is the truth, and so Michael believes that he has the truth, and there are stories that he believes, and, well, my, my friend Michael... He, he, he believes the stories that he has no skills, no marketable skills, and therefore he doesn't have a job and he can't find a job. And he has believed the lie that he is not good enough and that he's a loser. And he fully believes that that is the truth and that is the story that he believes about himself. And he is convinced in his mind that he's just a loser and he'll never measure up. And so not only if Michael's life is going to be changed as... Is, is his own freedom a barrier, but that the, the truth and the stories he believes about himself also has to be changed in order for him to believe God's truth about himself. And, and, then, and then it gets, then it gets even, even more, and I know we're going a little bit long on time, so I'm gonna try to make this part really, really, really short, but then there is the factor of what we might call angels and demons. I know at this point it gets really uncomfortable. And at this point, some of you are like, okay, it's 10 after. I've been here long enough. I'm checking out. Um, I, I'm just encouraging you, just, just hang in there a little bit, a little bit longer, okay? I'm almost done. Um, the book of Daniel, you know, like Daniel in the lion's den, near the end of Daniel's life, God begins to give Daniel these visions of what the future is going to look like. And a lot of them have to do with like kingdoms and political rulers and the, and, and, and the rise and fall of various kingdoms leading up to, and then even a vision of Jesus and the Messiah. I mean, it, the, the book of Daniel is super, super fascinating. Here's, let me just read a part of Daniel chapter 10. And I just want you to, to, to look at what else is going on behind the scenes in this invisible world and Daniel gets, gets, gets a peek at it, okay? Um, Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation or a vision about the future was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. And then Daniel writes, At that time, I, Daniel, I mourned for three weeks 
I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So Daniel has three weeks of agony, okay? Then, finally, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz. His face was like lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and legs were like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice was like the sound of a multitude." Okay, so this is, this is no ordinary human. This isn't just human. This is God showing up. This is an angel. This, this, there, there's something special going on here. I, Daniel, I was the only one who saw the vision. The others who were with me, they did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and they hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. And then I heard him speaking. And as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. Last week, Javier shared the story of praying. And he sees the hand of God in front of him. He says, God, touch me. And he says, I can't touch you, for I'm holy. If I touch you, I'll die. And he was terrified, reads the Bible, turns his life over to Jesus. This is like one of those similar kind of moments, okay? Spirit, like God's power is at work, like we said earlier. And the other guys, they can't see it or hear it, but they feel it and they run away. Daniel stays there. Then he continued. And he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But that was 21 days ago. Daniel kind of gets the sense, this vision. He begins to pray, and he's like, Lord, I'm thinking, I'm feeling something. What does it mean? I want to know your will. God, reveal your truth to me. And Daniel is in agony for 21 days. Why does it take God 21 days to answer his prayer? Well, he, he kind of tells him. Verse 13, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. And then Michael, different Michael here, okay? I I probably should have chosen a different name now. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to you, your people, and to the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. When he was saying to this to me, I bowed my face toward the ground and I was speechless. Then the one who looked like a man but wasn't a man, he touched my lips. I opened my mouth and I began to speak. I said to the one standing before me. Oh, that's, that's the rest of the end of it. Okay, okay. Did you notice the part where he says, so you prayed and you asked God, but I, this angel, I was detained by the prince of Persia, something with the king, but not like the king. And what he does is he gives him this glimpse into the unseen world in which this angel was detained by another spirit, another angel, as if there's like fighting in the unseen world. So much so that God sends Michael, another angel, to help him out. Yeah. And if this is all very uncomfortable, good. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's not supposed to be taken lightly. All of that, all of that, and and later on, hey, we got a snow day. You got plenty of time. Read all these chapters. It's super fascinating, okay? Here's the summary, though. All that to say that there is more happening than just what you and I can see and feel. And the God who is invisible and his angels were invisible, that there is also a force for evil in the world that is also invisible. And there is a battle between good and evil, invisible forces happening. And Daniel started to pray, but he didn't hear anything for 21 days of agony because in those 21 days, angels are fighting, trying to get to him, but they're detained? Yeah. Oh, this prayer thing, it's complicated. It's big. Okay, let, let's continue on, though. A couple, couple more. There, there's, there's even a couple more kind of here. How about other people's freedom? It's just not the person's freedom that you're praying for, but other people as well. And then lastly, how about this one? The laws of nature. 
and what we might call cause and effect. The weather. We regularly pray for the weather to change. I feel bad for God having to decide which one of us to listen to. Because if I'm praying for rain, my buddy's praying for sun, God's like, hmm, which do I like more of you? Oh, man. Okay, well, there's eight people praying for rain. There's three people praying for sun. I guess I have to go with the majority. But that's that's not complicated with something as crazy as the weather. But it's significant, right? It's just kind of the way, and I I believe God firmly changes and influences the weather. How about nutrition? Like, God has set up our bodies to operate in a certain way, and I'm praying for my friend Michael, but Michael consists and eats only ho-hos and energy drinks and wonders why he doesn't feel great. And God's like, "Ah, I'd love to make him feel great, but that just might influence him to eat more ho-hos and more energy drinks. Not good for you. Like, I've set up your body to be physically healthy, but if you don't want to operate with the ways that you're just not going to. Here's here's, where I'm going about this. As I've thought about this, these, and I'm sure there's more, but these are just the ones that I'm thinking. These are almost like, if I can use the example of like Star Wars and kind of uh, science fiction, each of these are almost, you could think of like force fields around a person's life that has to do with their freedom, other freedoms. And when I pray and I say, God, I want you to change my friend Michael's life. In this example, God if he's going to do what I ask to do, he has to penetrate through like five different force fields that he has set up for how we live our lives. God's like, man, that's hard. I'm tired. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not at all. That's not the point of it. The point is not that it's hard. The point is that it's complicated. The point is that it takes time. Because in this one area, Daniel, there were three weeks just because of this one issue of like angels and demons. What if Daniel had given up and stopped praying on the second day or the end of the first week? He's like, ah, God's not listening. God's not going to answer my prayer. I guess, you know, God doesn't want me to. And he quit praying. God's like, no, keep on praying because even the act of prayer somehow influences the battle. And this gets us to our last one. Yes, I'm already done. I, I'm, almost, I'm almost done, so hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. What do I do when my prayer isn't answered? First of all, keep praying. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, because now you know just how complicated it is. Especially for those big prayers where we are praying for other people to change and to be changed, and sometimes they don't even, aren't even interested in the change. This is a big, complicated prayer with lots of factors. And you just got to keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, and keep praying. And I wonder sometimes if one of the factors involved in continuing and keep praying, keep praying, is God asking us, how badly do you want it? See, there's lots of things I used to go to my dad and say, Dad, I want this. But then the next day, I forgot about it. And if he would have just given me everything I always wanted as soon as I asked for it, I would have got a lot of things that I didn't really want. But the thing that my kids come back to me and 21 days later, they're still talking about it. Three months later, they're still talking about it. I'm like, you haven't forgotten about this. This isn't just a phase. You really care about this thing, and I'm glad to give it to you if you really want it. I wonder if sometimes, I wonder if sometimes God is like, I want to give this to you, but when I give it to you, I want you to make the most of it. Be a good steward of it. Can you be trusted with this answer to prayer? And by praying over 21 days or 21 months, God says, yes, you can be trusted with it. So keep praying. Second thing, what do I do when my prayer isn't answered? Change your prayers to be more specific. See, that's actually one of the values of prayer, and one of the things we learn as we talk to God is, is, is that I've been praying this way, and as I'm praying this way, I'm praying to be more specific. Let's go back to the, go back to the whiteboard really quickly, if, uh, if we could. Okay, you see... You see, I recognize that maybe, maybe one of the core pieces in my friend Michael's life is, um, is he's battling with the truth. 
And so I'm going to say, okay, God, God, I pray, I pray that, God, I pray that you would send an angel to stop the demon who's lying to him. That's a very specific prayer. And I think when we pray those very specific prayers, God's like, now we're getting somewhere. We can do that. Hey, angel, go over there and, and silence and mute that, that spirit that's whispering lies to our friend Michael. And things begin to change. But you're praying more specifically now. And that's part of the value of keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. And I say, God, 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 there's some other people in Michael's life that he's more likely to listen to than I am. So some of your people who listen to you. And so, God, I pray that you would send other people into Michael's life who would talk to him, influence him. God, I pray that he would apply for a job with one of your people who will love him, care for him, influence him. Now you're praying more specifically. You're like, this is starting to look like a, this is starting to look like a, a, a football play here. Well, kind of, yeah. This is praying strategically. This is praying specifically because now you know some of the factors that are in, pl in play and you just begin to pray and pray and pray. So change your prayers to be more specific. And the third thing I want to encourage you is to imagine God's power at work. As you're praying, whatever you're praying for, imagine that the results of what you're praying for are already happening. Imagine your friend Michael there bowing his head, bowing his knees, saying, God, I turn my life over to you. And you see it, and you say, God, that's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for those words, and you say it out loud because we know there is something special about speaking words out loud. There's unseen power in words. And you imagine God's power at work, and that fuels your prayer. It fuels your prayer. It fuels your prayer. Because in the end, and I'm going to invite the worship team. They're going to come on back, and we're going to finish this off here. But uh, you see, in the end, here's what we discover. The prayer is a conversation in a relationship. Jesus said prayer is like taking your needs and requests to your dad. And if you focus too much on prayer then what you'll do is you'll ask questions like, okay, how do I need to say it in just the right way? How do I need to pray? When do I need to pray? How do I need to pray just right so that God will answer? You know what's that the equivalent of? That is the equivalent of saying, how do I need to ask my dad at just the right time in just the right way so that he's more likely to give me what I want? I got to make sure to ask him after dinner, not before, because sometimes he gets a bit hangry. And I got to ask really... You know what that's called? That's called manipulation. And when we're kids, we learn how to do it pretty well, don't we? How to ask when and where just the right way to get what we want. That's basically trying to manipulate your parent. And God who wants us to love him does not want to be manipulated. So in the end, it's not really about prayer. It's about God and his invisible power and my relationship with him. And relationships are built in trust. And trust grows as we spend time together. Trust grows as we talk. As I hear from him and as he speaks to me and I watch God and work and I spend time with him, trust grows. And as trust grows, well, did you know trust is also translated faith? And so part of the reason to keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying is not because your prayers are accomplishing something. It's because as you're praying, you are relating and building trust with God in heaven. And you're getting to know him. And you're trusting him more and more. If you pray and your prayer isn't answered, and you say, well, God didn't answer my prayer, and you walk away and stop talking to him, you're going to become bitter and angry because you cut off the relationship and lost trust. But if you keep talking to him and 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 you keep praying, even when your prayers aren't answered, because you trust him so much, you say, I just, I guess I just don't understand. But God, I love you and I trust you. Because I trust you, I don't need to understand. I trust you. And the more you, tr and the more you pray, the more you build trust and in the end, it's not about prayer. It's about the relationship with your Father in heaven. Prayer changes things? No. God changes things. So get to know God through unceasing prayer. Come on, bow your heads with me. And in this third week of Pray First, 
we are especially going to pray for people. So I want you to think about somebody in your life for whom you have already been praying a long time. And I'm going to pray, and I want you to just continue that prayer for them. Like we've talked about today, be really specific. Maybe it's time to change your prayer to be more specific. Begin to imagine God's power at work in their life and make a commitment today. Ask God to strengthen you, to remind you, to give you the courage to keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying for them. As we sing this last song, I'm just going gonna, gonna to pray for you and everyone watching, whenever you watch this, that God is going to empower you to never give up and to keep on praying, staying close to him. So you can sing along. Or maybe you just hit your knees right there in your living room, your bedroom, wherever you are, and you begin to cry out for God and draw close to God in unceasing prayer. God, do what only you can do. Guys, why don't you sing for us and lead us as all of us go to the Lord in prayer today.